you get to the most sessions will be entered to win a prize. And um, you can get stickers at the very end of the session. But like I said, if you have questions about this, please see us at the end. And then also, you will be videotaped video and photographed during the session. So if anyone is uncomfortable with that, please sit in the back or go to the back and speak with someone back there who can help you. Or you can give me your name and email, and I'll make sure that um, you'll be taken care of. And then at the very end of the session, we'll be having a question and answer session. Like I said, there are several ways to ask questions. And um, we'll be starting the session momentarily. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Dave Hall. I'm the Dean of IST. I wish she would told me about the videotaping. I would have brought in the stunt dean or at least uh, had some makeup put on before I did this. Uh, welcome to Startup Week. This is our third annual Startup Week. Uh, we originally started this uh, in celebration of the generosity of David Rusenko. Uh, he and his colleagues who were former students of IST uh, started Weebly.com and uh, he gave us, was very generous and gave us a scholarship uh, particularly aimed for entrepreneurial students. Uh, each year has gotten sort of bigger and better. Uh, this year we have uh, 43 speakers. Uh, 31 of those are Penn State grads, uh, 14 different majors representing eight different colleges. Uh, these folks come from all over the country and uh, take time out of their uh, very, very busy schedules to be with us. And so we're very pleased that they found their way to State College to be with us. Um, we have an entire exciting week, and you'll see schedules and, and all that. So I encourage you to uh, participate in as many of those uh, activities as you can. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, introduce David Rees. Uh, David Rees uh, is a long-term uh, friend and donor and workhorse for IST. David was uh, on the, the original uh, chair of the original um, IST advisory board. Uh, he's now gone through three deans, which I think is an impressive uh, uh, <laughs> tribute to his uh, staying power. Uh, David's the CEO of API Systems, which is a cloud computing virtualization practice. Uh, previously, he was the CEO of ACTV, which is a media tech company, uh, and that was sold to uh, Liberty Media. He began his career with Deloitte and specialized in consumer electronics fields. Um, he has been uh, very much of a wonderful friend uh, to IST. And those of you who pass by his, uh, the cafe that's named after him uh, every day, uh, hopefully you'll appreciate the, uh, all the kinds of things that he's done. So uh, David, in his own right, has been a pioneer in uh, the IT uh, field. And uh, I now introduce him. Thank you, David. Thank you, Dave. I can tell you when, uh, when the dean actually retires, although we haven't told him yet, we're really not letting him out the door. It'll be a great loss for the program. But thank you all for being here. Um, I, I must tell you to stand here when I remember this building just being some pieces of steel and some scaffolding and the effort that's gone in and how the IST program has advanced. It's, uh, it, it touches you emotionally. I, I hope you all appreciate just how fortunate you are to be a part of this program because um, when we envisioned this, and I'm embarrassed to say in the mid to late 90s, I don't think any of us could have imagined that this program would be as, as successful as it is. And Dave, you've been a great friend. Uh, you've been a great mentor to this program, and uh, I'm going to personally be very sorry to see you go. I have a number of responsibilities today, uh, but before I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to acknowledge the gentleman who is the professor of the course that um, has been taken over today, Don Shemansky. For those of you who know Don, not only is he as recognized a professor in IST as anyone who's come through these hallowed halls, but Donald and I have been lifelong best friends. And for those of you who are privileged enough to have been in or will be in one of his classes, he is one of the brightest, one of the most experienced people I've ever met. And I encourage you to take his class and I encourage you to listen to what he has to say because I attribute much of my success to his leadership when we were growing up. So thank you, Donald. And then most importantly, I have the privilege of introducing the gentleman who will be the keynote speaker to kick off Startup Week this year. Dan Mead is the president and the CEO of Verizon Wireless. 
Most of you know Verizon Wireless as a brand. What you probably don't understand is Verizon Wireless serves over 100 million customers today in America. Their 4G LTE service is the fastest, most advanced, most reliable network in the country. I'm certain many of you are customers. In my pocket right now is a mobile device that I use basically to keep myself tethered to the world. It's how I get email. Those of you who are old enough to remember what email is. But I use it for email. I use it for my web. I don't do a whole lot of social media on it. Not because I'm too old to use social media, because I can't see the characters on my iPhone 5. And I told Dan, I need to graduate to the uh, Samsung Galaxy. Dan has been recognized both in his profession and, and to me, maybe emotionally more importantly, by Penn State for his many accomplishments. He was recognized in 2008 as an alumni fellow at Penn State, which is the highest award that the Alumni Association bestows on a graduate. More importantly, in 2010, he was, he was recognized as a distinguished alum. And I can tell you very few people in this university have had the professional achievements that allow them to qualify for that recognition. And it speaks volumes on Dan's career and his accomplishments. And we're all very, very fortunate to have an individual of Dan's stature to be our representative today. Uh, Dan has a number of people with him, executives from Verizon, as well as an individual who has a relationship with Verizon. Dan, I'll allow you to introduce those people. But um, Dan's had a very interesting career, and although Verizon is a household name brand, and obviously quite a large company, it really is no different than the startups that many of you are involved with today, because if you think back to my generation, the concept of mobile communications, mobile connectivity, there are very few people who had the wisdom and the intelligence to see that far ahead. Dan was involved in many aspects of making Verizon what it is today. There were significant mergers that occurred uh, in the 90s, most notably when Bell Atlantic, which was the phone company for the Mid-Atlantic States, merged with 9X, which was New York and New England. And then in 99 and 2000, when uh, what would become Verizon merged with Vodafone to create, obviously, the largest mobile network in America today. So with that, it is my great privilege to introduce Mr. Dan Mead. Well, David, thank you very much for that kind introduction. It is great to be here with you. Uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about Verizon that I'm guessing that you don't know, and it's a very heavy focus on innovation. And I brought a couple of Penn State graduates along that have helped shape the Verizon of today, and I'm going to introduce them and ask them to come up, and then we'll get started. We have a lot to share with you. Uh, Nikki Palmer, if you would come up, please. Nikki is our chief network officer, uh, engineering graduate from here at the university, responsible for rolling out all of LTE, and uh, she is responsible for the technology for the whole country. And then we have Chris Krieger. Uh, Chris Krieger is our senior vice president, also a Penn State graduate. Chris is in our emerging business and our development organization, and he's going to share with you some of what we do around innovation. And then we have something new that we did. Uh, this year, we had powerful answers. And it was a competition that we wanted to have to have a, a strong social impact using technology. So we decided to have a global competition in the areas of healthcare, education, and energy. And we're very pleased to have Yopang Yo here, who is, uh, who is with us. He just won a million dollars from Verizon, and I thought you might want to hear about that. <laughs> so why don't you come out and, and join us, Yopang? So we're, we have a little bit of time with you. We're going to come at this from those different aspects of the business, but I think the way to get us started is to take a look at a video that will help frame what we're doing. And by the way, Don, thanks for letting us take your class over. We're, we're, we're glad to be here. All right, so if we could run the first video, please.
So that gives you a little sense about what we're doing. We're going to get deeper into this. Nikki is going to talk about networks. So she not only runs the wireless network, but she was also engaged in Fios, which any of you have Fios at your homes? Any of you? Yeah, quite a few of you, maybe at your folks' place. So that is a startup business for us. It's about eight years old. And uh, Chris has been very involved in that. Chris was president of, of New York, and he was down in Maryland. And uh, Nikki was engineering that, and, and I used to have responsibility for running that organization when it was a startup before I came back into wireless. So uh, Nikki will talk about what is going on with the networks. We have a global fiber network that provides a lot of the data transfer around the world for the banks and other institutions. She can touch on that. And uh, especially what we're doing with LTE, you may not know this, but we were the first commercial company to launch LTE anywhere around the globe. And over 50% of the global LTE traffic is on the Verizon Wireless Network today. So we were, we were an early adopter and, and got that out there. So that's what you hear from Nikki. Now, one of the things that we knew was that we weren't smart enough to invent everything ourselves, that we needed an, a different engagement in terms of what is going on in the marketplace, maybe folks like you. So we do a lot in Silicon Valley. And, and one of the things that we wanted to do was to have an innovation center, now two of them, one in Waltham, Massachusetts, and the other in San Francisco. We did that because we wanted thought leaders with new ideas to come be part of our company and work with us, try to commercialize things. If they didn't work, that's fine. And there was no obligation for the partners to come in with us. They could come in, use our network, use our facilities. And if they if it worked out that we would do business together in the future, great. If it worked out that we learned something, that's even better. And uh, that is something that Chris is going to be addressing. Uh, we also just restructured our company a couple of weeks ago. And we put, we've been buying businesses in Silicon Valley. Uh, we've been buying businesses in telematics. And we've put all of those businesses together under one leader along with product development so that we can stimulate the throughput of innovation. So that's the area that Chris will talk about. And then Yopang, I gave you a little bit of a lead in. He and his company had such a great invention in healthcare for vision. And he's going to show you that and tell you a little bit about the process. So uh, let's get started on the network piece with Nikki. All right. Thank you, Dan. Can you hear me? OK. Well. Congratulations for having this great startup week. We are thrilled to be here with you. I'm happy to be back at my alma mater and uh, really good to see everybody up at a good hour on a rainy Monday morning hitting the classroom. So I am, I am thrilled that you're here and glad to be here with you. So, um, you know, Dan led in uh, with a little bit about what I want to talk about today. And um, I thought what might be interesting to you in, in this theme of startup week is that you can have startups and a feeling of entre entrepreneurship and innovation within sort of the confines of a big company sometimes. And frankly, I will tell you, that is what has kept me at Verizon for now 24 years since I graduated from Penn State in 1990. Never thought I would be at the same company for so many years. Probably many of you won't have that type of career path. Um, it, it's not as common as it, as it used to be. But one of the things that has kept me there is this feeling of doing something new and innovative at every turn. And as Dan mentioned, uh, I have an engineering degree and I've spent my career working in the engineering operations technology side of our business, which is just a fantastic um, place to be. And you know, one of the things that I tell um, students, you know, young students, young girls oftentimes, is that uh, you can't really avoid technology. That you know, technology today is, is an underpinning of just about any career, um, any industry. I mean, if you want to be a fashion designer or a farmer, technology is going to make you a better one. So um, that is uh, something I feel pretty strongly about. And luckily at Verizon, we're, we're here to enable a lot of that. So let me tell you a little bit about um, the two big projects, um, big initiatives that I was lucky to be a part of at, at Verizon. And the first is Fios, as Dan mentioned. And if you wind back the clock a number of years, um, 
you know, the cable companies, uh, and I'm not here to disparage the cable companies, they're our competitors, but really it was a market that was fairly stagnant and with prices increasing about 7% a year on average. And we felt like we could do something better in that marketplace. And, and frankly, we've tried a lot of different things in small pockets, but never really could get the whole package to work in terms of the technology and the product offering at a price uh, and a cost that made some sense. And as with many uh, technology innovations, you know, sometimes it's one thing, sometimes it's a slow evolution of things. But we began um, in, you know, maybe 2003, four time frame to believe that, you know, the economics were getting to the right point, that there had been technology advancements in, in optical uh, equipment and in other areas of the end to end solution where we felt we could take a fiber optic cable and take that directly to someone's home not just partway there, not just at the curb, but actually take fiber, glass, all the way into the home and provide from that a data service, right? Your broadband home service, a TV service, and a phone service, right? And that was sort of the, that was the, the idea at the time. So how innovation works in a company like Verizon when you want to do something big like that is, you know, that's a big bet, first of all. And sometimes it's, it's difficult for small companies to be able to make a bet like that. Um, but in Verizon, once we figured out that the economics we thought worked, um, this turned out to be about a 20, I don't know, what are we up to, maybe 25, 25 now, billion dollar bet over the, course of, uh, over the course of the next several years. So this is a big deal. So this is something that has to be socialized um, with your board of directors, has to be socialized with, um, with the FCC and with the government in some cases. So multifaceted uh, type of major investment. But what happens within the company or the way that we did it is we said, you know what, we don't want to be um, tied by the way that we do things. And this is really important, I think, of how you innovate in a big company. So we pulled people from around the company, people from engineering, people from IT, people from human resources, people from finance, people from the field construction groups, and we kind of sequestered them and made them in a way feel like a small company within a big company. And the other key thing was we told them, all right, Pretend you really, in some ways, don't work for Verizon. You, you're not shackled by any of the practices that we currently have. If we could leverage them because we have the scale, that's fabulous. But we want to think outside the box. And how are we going to make this work um, in order to bring something to consumers? So we had a very small team that sort of incubated this and developed best practices from scratch. And I think that's really important because sometimes if you try to do these big things within a big company, you're going to go back to the way you always do things, which may not work in a new world. So that was one part of it. Um, and, you know, as I think about LTE as another major innovation, again, a technology innovation that ends up bringing you know, so much um, value to consumers. You know, one thing that's constant in our business, it was true with Fios and it underlies uh, 4G LTE as well, is uh, bandwidth and technology, you know, and consumption of bandwidth. So you all have cell, is there anyone who doesn't have a cell phone here? Yeah, I didn't think so. Um, and is there anyone that, you know, uses, that doesn't use it that much or that uses less than uh, two gigabytes of data a month? Because if you do, well, I can t show you some apps maybe that you might want to, we could use some more. Um, but the point is, we've been watching these trends on data, you know, on consumption and on hunger for, for bandwidth. And that underlies what we did in the home with Fios and how we knew that by putting fiber all the, all the way to the home, you're in essence future-proofing that network to provide you know, greater and greater services. The same thing really happened with 4G LTE. As we see the demand for data in a mobile world rising, it was time to you know, sort of do this technology dance, right? And we were, there was a time where we were on analog networks and 2G networks and 3G networks. But when we decided to go to LTE 
or long-term evolution as the 4G network standard. I will tell you, I mean, I don't know if any of you remember, it was a few years ago if you pay attention to this kind of stuff, but um, there was a great debate in the industry about what the standard would be. Sprint was out there with WiMAX, there was other things being toyed with all around the world, but we made a big statement and said, we will, we choose, Verizon chooses LTE as the 4G standard. And we sort of set the stage for that. So another thing with innovation sometimes is you got to be bold. And I think that was a step that we took here. But it's not just about the words, it's about how do you follow it up. So Chris is going to talk to you in a minute about our innovation centers um, and some of the products that come out of them. But I can tell you that one of the early reasons that we developed these centers was so that we could make true on our, our statement of LTE being the 4G standard. Because it's not just about the networks that we can build and the devices we can sell on those networks. It's about the chipset manufacturers of the world and what technology they're putting into the chips. It's about the operating systems. It's about the infrastructure providers. So there's a whole ecosystem out there that really needs to be nurtured. And we believed that for, for LTE to be the 4G standard, we really needed to sort of incubate that and help that along. Again, um, big innovation inside a big company. Um, so that's what we did with the innovation centers. And then we went ahead to launch um, LTE in a very, very big way. So we set about, you know, constructing LTE, which really means bringing, again, fiber um, to each and every one of our cell sites. We have, you know, 45,000 or so of these around the country, bringing a fiber facility to each and every one of them. Um, changing our whole infrastructure of what those cell sites connect to, making it all IP-based, all flat IP-based network. Um, I think from what I've seen about some of what you all study, some of you may be taking some security um, classes. It's a very, very big focus. So anything, obviously, that we do, whether it's in our landline networks or our mobile networks, must always be secure, and that's part of our brand promise to our consumers as well as our enterprise customers. So it's thinking about all of those things up and down the chain and then building a network that can really stand for our brand, which is the most reliable. And it's got to work every time, right? So that's what we did, and the in, uh, innovation centers sort of helped to make that a reality. And here we stand. We launched LTE in December of 2010. And here we are, you know, three and a half or so years later, and we have the largest LTE network that covers over 99% um, of our existing 3G networks, over 97% of the U.S. population, coast to coast. And we're only just getting started because now, as you use more and more data, we build more and more network to support that demand. So, um, again, sometimes we think of innovation as um, a guy in a garage or a, or a gal in the, uh, in the back room kind of coding something that someone ends up buying and is the next big thing. And that's true, um, as you will see. <laughs> but innovation can also be about bringing new technology um, into uh, the hands of consumers in a very meaningful way. And if you're able to do that with a big company, what that means is, you know, you get the fun and the joy of innovating and you also have uh, financial backing as well. So to me, it's been, uh, it's been a really, really good ride. So I'm happy to take your questions later, but Let's I think that's first. what we got. Well, thank you. Yep. Uh, good morning, everyone. And once again, thanks for being here. It's a delight to be back in this facility. I didn't have uh, many classrooms that looked as nice as this place yeah. today. So you <laughs> yeah. really count yourself uh, very fortuitous. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm part of the product team, and the product team is an interesting group within Verizon because what we've tried to do is to create a, an organization where a couple things happen. One, it's a place where all of our product managers sit. So the, for anything from the development of new products and services that we're going to offer to maintaining those products and evolving those products to also then managing the life cycle. At the end of that, that life cycle, you know, if we need to turn things down and move to a new evolution of products, we do those sorts of things. But there's two other parts that I think are interesting that I'd like to introduce to you today that aren't well known, and that is we have a labs organization. These are people who are mostly focused on developing new retail products for uh, Verizon. And as, in addition to the labs organization, we have innovation centers, as both Dan and Nikki uh, talked about. 
There's a few lessons that we've learned, though, around innovation, I think, over time. Um, Nikki talked about the Fios network that we built. Uh, that's a great example of you have a great idea and it turns into a great asset. You can continue to innovate around that product over and over and over. And for a company like Verizon, uh, as opposed to a startup, that's absolutely essential. You have to have a culture that is always innovating and trying to get the next best uh, evolution or generation of something or going on to the next best idea. Fios as an example is one where I looked at some uh, presentations we had actually literally last week when we first pitched at and we were making, we were groundbreaking, or taking groundbreaking steps here to introduce 50 high definition channels when we first launched this. So look at where we're at now. I think we have 30 some thousand video on demand titles. We have uh, you know broadband speed downloads of 500 meg. Um, and we did some things last week. As a matter of fact, we, we launched a new product with Fios, uh, 12 tuner DVR. So if you want to record 12 shows at once, you can do those sorts of things. By the end of this year, we're going to have over 100 uh, full linear channels uh, on mobile devices out of the home over our LTE network. And so you sort of get the point. The lesson here is there's a ton of innovation that happens within big companies. And the only way you can stay ahead of the game and lead your industry is to continue to innovate and think about how to do that uh, and to keep that leadership position. So let me introduce you now to uh, two sides of Verizon that you probably uh, don't think of. Uh, your experience with Verizon largely might have been walking into one of our fabulous uh, wireless stores or perhaps you, you know, on the file side you may have talked to a technician or one of our call centers. But let me talk a little bit about the labs and the uh, innovation centers that we have. Um, we recognize the need to sort of wall off uh, folks who can really focus on developing and don't get encumbered by, you know, the largeness, if you will, and the complexity of a big company like Verizon. And so we have uh, lab teams that are in Waltham, Massachusetts, sort of in the tech corridor just outside Boston, uh, and we have them in Palo Alto uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, in the next few months, we're going to open a second facility in California in uh, Santa Clara. Uh, so rather than me sort of describe the work that they do, I'll talk about some of the output. I have a short video that I'd like to share with you that we actually just shot last week at Palo Alto. Innovation is all about perspective. We all discuss different paths to get here, and that's what makes Verizon Ads so powerful. So there's a big revolution in healthcare right now. But in Verizon Labs, we're developing technologies to help people get healthy and stay healthy. Imagine being able to manage your healthcare from the palm of your hand. You're able to talk to your doctor face to face, even if he's halfway around the world. And that's where the commercial health management platform from Verizon comes in. Uh, CHM wirelessly collects biometric data from glucometers, blood pressure monitors, weight scales, and pulse oximeters, and it allows the patient to view their overall health along with the clinician. It's that culture that attracts guys like the show. He used to work for NASA. He turned down like 100 jobs before joining us here at Verizon. Technology is making it possible for machines to help improve our daily lives in so many different ways. What we're trying to develop is a different approach. This approach is that the humans and machines and the barrier between those two starts to get diminished. The machine could reason about the surroundings, inform the human about those decisions, and the human can take some decisions and inform the machine. And these two things can start to coexist much more closely than they do right now. And I think that's one of the promises that we hold in developing these new technologies at the rise and rise. The gene is a very attractive technology. It's not only sitting in front of a screen anymore. The user experience can be anywhere. It's all around you. It's a world where things are in the home no one is at the office, and you keep things very easy when you get there. It really goes out the right part of it for you. It'll unlock your door for you, and turn on the lights for you, and turn on the sheet for you, and go get coffee. To play your favorite music, to really make you feel better. Our new Verizon Internet Services platform is going to change the way people use the Internet. It allows us to take our network assets and capabilities and create incredibly personalized services. So the experience becomes extremely relevant to the individual user. I came from startups. Working on some great ideas with some cool people at Google AM. But what I'm doing here is really big. You know, in music, the space between the notes is just as important as the notes themselves sometimes. 
And just like music, innovation happens when you create things that don't yet exist. There is a global communications revolution where people are going from being tethered to devices to being untethered. We're really good at authenticating devices. And so the real question is, how do you authenticate a human being? And the solution is biometrics, so voice print, fingerprint, cardiac signature, facial recognition, all of those are things that we can use to better identify exactly who you are. Verizon Labs is home to some of the most brilliant people on Earth. This is a bit of a better good anime for you. Not a bad gig for a kind of brand optical physicist. So hopefully you get a chance to understand some of the work that we have going on. As a matter of fact, the first um, employee in that talked about Converged Health Solutions. That's a product that we launched just two weeks ago, and uh, it's in the marketplace, and it allows um, uh, people to avoid going to see the doctor for typical routine medical screenings, uh, glucometer, and things of that nature. So the second uh, aspect, or second team in Verizon that I just want to introduce you to is our Verizon Innovation Centers. Uh, Dan mentioned this, Nikki mentioned this. As we think about innovation, it's not just the product products that we create that are our own products, but we want to be able to enable lots of partners and other businesses and lots of startups to come in, use the resources and the assets that we have that would allow them to develop products and services that enrich our business and also we can partner with to deliver products and services to our customers. And so we have innovation centers in Watham, Massachusetts and in San Francisco. Um, what we've done today is just to give you a better feel for this, we brought along a few products that are coming out of our innovation centers. Uh, we have a demo table that is in the next building just past uh, Oban Payne. Uh, we'd encourage you to stop by there afterwards. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, one of the products that you won't see here today, but uh, one that we, we work with the company to deliver is something called Big Belly Solar. Um, it's a trash can. Doesn't sound very sexy, right? Um, but uh, the beauty of this is uh, it allows uh, the, uh, the trash can or the municipality uh, company uh, to understand how much fill is within the, the trash can. Um, it's solar powered, it has a compactor built in, and it reads the measurements. And so no longer does the, um, the garbage collection company stop at a site that doesn't have to be collected. It saves time, it saves money, it saves effort. On the other hand, if you're at a location where there's a huge crowd, uh, you'll know that it's overfilling and you gotta go pick it up. So it enables a lot of different things. I happened to be at a dinner Saturday night going through Times Square and I stopped at the stoplight and I looked over and what do you know was sitting there? One of those trash collectors. Um, we have four things to share with you. It's something called GoldenEye. Uh, think of Google Glass, uh, but this is a commercial application as opposed to a personal application. Check it out. It's for first responders. Uh, we have a large uh, manufacturer of uh, commercial airlines that's currently using this so that it frees up the hands of employees who are actually working on aircraft. They can see information on a, uh, a user manual and so forth on the glass. We have Connected Athlete, which is a concept we're working on to uh, prevent sports injuries. We have something called Infosys, which is a way to measure f the levels of fuel in fuel tanks um, to, again, uh, help companies understand when need the fuel tanks need to be re um, refilled. And I'm um, trying to think, oh, Vigo, uh, which is a telepresence uh, uh, a product that we've offered. So I'd encourage you to go look at those. I think you'd be impressed with those and get, get to interact with the products and services that uh, you don't normally see uh, coming out of Verizon. So, Dan, I'll turn it back to you. All right. Uh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Nikki. So, for the, for the next section, Yopang is going to talk in a minute. We're going to run a video, but just let me give you a little bit of a context. Uh, Powerful Answers was created by our chairman because of the unique position that we have and the social responsibility that we have to use our technology to make a difference in the world. And I mentioned in my opening comments that it's focused on health care, education and energy management. So we created this global contest and we, we got people's attention and said uh, there, is, there is no obligation if you are a winner that we're going to buy your company or you have to operate on our network. We just, we just want to see great things happening. So we put up uh, 10 million dollars for the contest. We had a group of independent judges that sifted through hundreds and hundreds of applications for solutions. So let me run the video to help put that in context and then we'll turn it over to Yopang and you'll, you'll get the story on, on how this all works and uh, we are so proud to have him here with us. So if we could run the next video please. Thank you. 
So, uh, how do you win a million dollar? <laughs> uh, no, thanks for inviting me uh, here. It's great to back to uh, you know campus feeling. Uh, actually, just a little bit my background. I'm a student as well. I'm doing MBA at NYU Stern at the moment. Um, so you know, it, it's a the whole startup thing. It's a, such a rewarding experience. You know, winning the award, but also, you know, it's just sort of your own eager, you want to do something, and you get it recognized. It's such a great feeling. Um, so a little bit about our background, what we're trying to do. Um, we're Smart Vision Labs, and they're located in New York City. Uh, we started 2012, April. Um, the, the problem we try to solve is in developing countries, there are a lot of people don't wear eyeglasses, and they're losing their vision because of it. You know, you get, I mean, it, it's amazing to think, you know, you're losing vision because you don't wear eyeglasses. It's just the problem not existing in this country. So the reason for that is, you know, there are no trained medical professional. You need a four years training to be optometrist, to giving a prescription. And also the uh, equipment they use costs 25K. It's just not existing in India. So I saw why not we use you know, the camera we have in our pocket do this. It's just, it, we have this supercomputer in our pocket. We can do so many things. So th that's the idea. We come up with, the, you know, you take, use your camera, take a picture of your eye, and then we can collect that data and generate perception on your smartphone. Um, so, you know, we, we, we started the uh, company uh, 2012, and uh, we're working on the idea on my kitchen table, uh, you know, before then, we don't have any money, any support. We just want to build a prototype. And uh, I, I have a full-time job, and uh, I was an MBA student, and I'm trying to do experiment uh, after, you know, 10 p.m., I finish my homework. Uh, so, uh, you know, we, we're working on the prototype, working on the, um, the business model, uh, until last year, you know, we, we heard about this uh, Rise and Powerful Answers Award. Uh, you know, we are an eager startup. We want to collect any money we can find. Uh, this is a great resource for us to practice uh, our business model and getting recognized in the industry. Uh, so we submit our application in May, and we went through, we went through a three round of judge, uh, the judge. So the Preliminary round, uh, semi-final, and the final, we went to uh, San Francisco Innovation Center, did a presentation. Uh, you know, that I think the whole process for us is really about learning. Uh, you know, getting, getting the award, of course, is the best thing. But along the way, you know, developing a startup, I mean, you know, you're learning engineering in this college, but also you need to learn who you want to sell what kind of value you provide, um, you know, who is your distribution network. It's, it's a whole lot of stuff you need to figure out. And uh, along the way, by going through the Verizon Powerful Answer Award, we, uh, we try to figure out those, each up answer for those questions. And, uh, and actually, we're getting a lot of feedback, you know, from the judges, from the people we're talking to, our, you know, the other team try to competing with us, and we learned the process. Um, and uh, earlier this year in CES, uh, we learned that uh, we the uh, top prize winner. Uh, you know, all of a sudden our life changed. Um, <laughs> it, it used to be uh, me and my co-founder Mark. We were working on the project day and night. Now we have five people. We have engineers now uh, to help us. So uh, you know, it used to be that. Uh, we went to place to place, try to pitch people our idea. Now actually people start sending us email, find out what we're doing. And then we got an email um, a couple months ago from a school nurse in California, you know. So they have a school district of 1,300 uh, students. And in California, K-12 school vision exam is mandatory. And this nurse has to do 400 kids each year. You know, it's still a technology invent over a hundred years ago, 10 feet away, eye chart. You're not really learning much information on a school kid's eye that way. So, 
she called us and we said, why don't we give you a device that we invented? Immediately, you can measure the uh, eye refraction data and you can just push a button and send an email to the parents and hook up with the uh, doctor, eye doctor. If you, your kids need a pair of eyeglasses, you can get it right away. So it, it's, I think, if you are here to do startup and you want to do activity to execute your own vision, do it. And the uh, powerful answer to the war is such a great venue to get funding first and also, I think, getting that credential, credibility. You know, I'm a student and, you know, I, I can't imagine three months ago or four months ago I'm sitting here to tell you how to start a company. But today I'm tell, you know, sitting here trying to tell the story on my own. That's because we got recognized, you know, people resounding echo with our idea. And, uh, you know, when you have an idea, you try to solve a real problem. There are people out there trying to support you, just like the Startup Week. You're meeting people from Verizon, you're meeting people from, you know, other startup, getting help. And uh, I would say, try to do, do startup and uh, go to Verizon right Powerful Answer the Award and try to win the competition. <laughs> All right, uh, so thank you, Yopeng. So uh, just in the last couple of days, we started the next round. So Powerful Answers 2 is just getting started, if any of you uh, want to be part of that. I think it's time for Q&A. Uh, and uh, Brittany, who has been an intern with us mm -hmm. at Verizon last summer, and again this summer, is going to be helping us with that. And uh, I, I think we're ready to go. OK, ready to go with questions for us? Oh, also, I should mention, we have Kate here. Kate, could you stand up? Another Penn State graduate who is in our HR department. So if any of you are interested in internships or full-time employment with Verizon, uh, please, please come up and see Kate. Uh, we have 44 new people that are either interns or full-time employees starting with us from Penn State uh, this summer. And we have around 800 Penn State alums that are part of the Verizon family. Okay, so. Yeah, no, wait. So as I mentioned earlier, there are several ways to ask questions. You can always raise your hand, but you'll see that there are cards in front of you on the table that say IST Startup Week, so you can um, text to Paul everywhere to ask your questions, or you can use the hashtag IST Startup Week on Twitter. Anyone want to do it the old-fashioned way? Just raise, raise your hand, we'll get started. Dean? Thank you. To, uh, first of all, thank all of you very much for coming. Uh, let, let's give them a round of applause for coming to see us. Yeah. And I was privileged this morning at breakfast to actually see the device uh, that has been built. Do you have it in front of you? Do you have it with you? I have it right there in my. Okay, so you get a chance to actually see that device, and uh, if you want your vision checked, uh, you can go ahead and do that. <laughs> so, um, I guess my uh, my question relates to uh, your innovation search for ideas and so on. How, how do you get the word out uh, to different people about the idea of having this competition and and encouraging people to uh, get started on it? Okay, so. Uh, Yopay, maybe you could tell us how you heard about it, but uh, one of the things that we did, we had a very large brand campaign. You, sh you should have seen it uh, during the NFL season through the fall, the Powerful Answers campaign. That was the overall positioning for this, and then we used social media. It, where, where did you see it? Twitter. Twitter? So, uh, you know, we, we use that uh, extensively for all the communications with our customers. So. That's what we'll continue to do again. I knew we were going to be here with you, and we just announced the second round of this and thought some of you might be interested. Okay. Go. Any questions, Brittany? Yeah, we do have a question. You want to use sure. We have a question from Twitter for Zaopeng. Can you explain what the biggest challenges that you faced were? Not thinking big enough. You know, I think Verizon is looking for big impact. And 
So when you have an idea, you need to think big enough. I think, you know, it's when, when entrepreneurs are telling you their story, the, the old motto is a niche market, right? That's no competition. Guess what? There's a reason there's no competition, because it's a small market. Uh, I think when you try to go to powerful answers or presenting to judge, you need to tell that your story out the big social impact your idea going to generate. That's the excitement they're looking for. So think big. Any other questions? Uh, if we have a, a gentleman right here. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, when we were contemplating bringing fiber to the home and providing a combination voice and data and TV service, um, 4G LTE was in the future. Um, so they weren't as related as you think, as you might think. Um, but there were a few other things going on in the marketplace. Um, you know, I mentioned the cable companies and. Um, and their rate increases year after year after year. So there was an underlying dissatisfaction that we were trying to exploit. But there was also the fact that the cable companies were now offering voice service. So that was a disruptor to our traditional, you know, copper line to the home uh, telephone service. And we could see what the future might hold if we didn't have something to compete within the home as well. So that was part of it. But we also knew just the, this insatiable dan, uh, demand for data was something that we would never bet against. I would never bet against it, you know, just having lived through all of these explosions of, uh, of demand. So we knew we wanted to be a part, a part of that. You know, maybe I'll just mention, mention one other thing while I'm thinking about it. Um, you know, when we think of 4G LTE, no matter what the wireless technology is, it really isn't a replacement for a dedicated service into your home. I mean, it, for, for example, today, our brand promise on 4G is 5 to 12 megabits on the download, 2 to 5 on the upload, right? Which most of us would probably be okay with in our home, especially in rural areas where they don't have a lot of broadband um, access. Um, however, the, the better service for home, you, you can't use that type of service to offer high-speed internet plus um, a TV offering with on-demand, simultaneous on-demand, and the services that Chris talked about um, delivering as well. So really, we, we look at them very differently. David? Okay, uh, I'm going to repeat the question here for those of you on the website. Uh, is there any thought about Verizon getting into the content business? Uh, not, not directly, David, uh, the, but we think that the issues are very important. So we're one of the top five content buyers in the United States. The, the other, uh, the cable companies, uh, we're going to be doing a lot more of that with 100 million wireless customers and uh, 6 million Fios customers. We, we have a pretty substantial buying power, especially as, as, the, as, it, uh, as the demand grows for wireless. But uh, that is not our core strength. Our core strength is around the networks, the quality of the networks that Nikki's been talking about. And we're going to stay in that area. You'll see us have all sorts of relationships with content providers. Uh, we are the wireless, uh, the wireless sponsor of the NFL. So if you go on to our NFL mobile app, that is a different sort of arrangement where we have exclusive content. 
Uh, we are the official wireless sponsor of the IndyCar Racing League, the Indianapolis 500, and we're doing a lot with, uh, with both social media and that content that's unique to us. So we'll come at it a different way versus a pure acquisition of content is the way that I think. So um, I think we're there. Are, I'm going to do a time check here. How, how are we doing on time, Brittany? Because I see, I think some folks have to go to classes, and I know that no one here would want to be late for a class. Okay. Competitors are also specifically focused on innovation. What is the key to Verizon's continuous ability to stay ahead? Okay. So the 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 question is, uh, we're in a highly competitive world. Uh, how are we going to stay ahead? Let me give you a perspective. Verizon Wireless is an $80 billion company. Our commitment is to grow by five to six billion dollars every year. So we've got to create a company the size of Yahoo every year that operates profitably for us to hit our business objectives. And we've been doing that and, and more the last several years. So it's, it's the reality of the marketplace. And we haven't talked about shareholders here, and I don't know how much you think about that, but making sure that, that we're delivering results that are important to customers so that we can satisfy the needs of our shareholders, because shareholders are fickle. They can move their money anywhere just as you can move yours, or you will someday, and we have to, we have to earn that. So we have a tremendous sense of urgency around innovation and a tremendous focus in terms of making sure that we're growing the business and we're, we're finding new ways to deliver services to our customers. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, we'll stand by up here if any of you want to come up and visit. And then I would encourage you to get over to the innovation displays over uh, through the cafe and out there. There's, there's some really interesting technologies that are not commercialized yet that are going to be coming out that you may find interesting, our multicast service and Vigo and some of those things. So uh, Chris mentioned them. It's been an honor for us to be here with you. It's always great to come back to campus. It's great to see the uh, good things that you're doing, and we, we look forward to seeing your output as, as you become innovators and help our society and, and maybe uh, you know, we'll be giving you a check for a million dollars someday. All right, thank you very much.